What a dense, complex book full of monsters and heroes. I'm Roger and this is Bookshook and today's podcast is all about the first half of East of Eden by John Steinbeck, published in 1952. So the idea of the podcast is that we'll read the first half of the book together and then I'll share my thoughts and yours on the first half of the book, maybe make a few predictions. And when we finish reading the book, I'll publish part two of the podcast. We'll decide whether it's one we'd recommend to a friend or not. Of course, you don't have to read anything at all. If you're into Audible, then you can listen to the book. Or you can do neither, of course, and just join me for the ride. I'll be summarising what happens in the book just for you, but be aware there may be spoilers. You can leave a comment or start a conversation at the Bookshook YouTube channel or send an email to bookshook at yahoo.com. Welcome to Bookshook. So I've read up to the end of chapter 24, which is roughly halfway. We start off with the narrator describing the richness and diversity of the Salinas Valley. And at the moment, the narrator is unnamed, but we do find out that that's actually Olive Hamilton's son. It's described how the fascinating names like, quote, Shirt Tail Canyon were so named. And the narrator does tend to philosophise at the beginning of chapters. The Hamiltons settle in the valley from Ireland, and there's a great description of Samuel and Lisa. Quote, Samuel had no equal for soothing hysteria and bringing quiet to a frightened child. It was the sweetness of his tongue and the tenderness of his soul. And just as there was a cleanness about his body, so there was a cleanness in his thinking. Men coming to his blacksmith shop to talk and listen dropped their cursing for a while, not from any kind of restraint, but automatically, as though this were not the place for it. And then of Lisa... Lisa had a finely developed sense of sin. Idleness was a sin. And card playing, which was kind of idleness to her, she was suspicious of fun, whether it involved dancing or singing or even laughter. She felt that people having a good time were wide open to the devil. And this was a shame, for Samuel was a laughing man. But I guess Samuel was wide open to the devil. His wife protected him whenever she could. So a land grab occurred in that valley. Quote, Perhaps they had filaments of memory of feudal Europe where great families became and remained great because they owned things. The early settlers took up land they didn't need and couldn't use. They took up worthless land just to own it. However, there were a number of these families and they got the good land of the valley and cleared the yellow mustard away and planted wheat. Such a man was Adam Trask. And so the Trask family introduced, and they were based in Connecticut originally. Their father, Cyrus, is a military man. Quote, Timidly, he began to tell Alice about his campaigns, but it was not long before he was equally sure that every one of his stories was true. Alice was his wife. The mother, Alice, is dying of consumption, and Alan's real mother killed herself. Charles is Alice's son and Adam's stepbrother. So basically we've got two brothers here. We've got Adam and Charles and their stepbrothers. Adam's father is a military disciplinarian as well. Uh, His half-brother, Charles, fits the mould, but Adam really doesn't. And Charles and Adam have terrible fights together. They have this game called Pee Wee and Adam gets really, really badly injured by Charles in this game. We have the very interesting thoughts by Cyrus on the army. Quote, I'll have you know that a soldier is the most holy of all humans because he is the most tested, most tested of all. I'll try to tell you. Look now, in all of history, men have been taught that killing of men is an evil thing not to be countenanced. Any man who kills must be destroyed because this is a great sin. Maybe the worst sin we know. And then we take a soldier and put murder in his hands and we say to him, use it well, use it wisely. We put no checks on him. Go out and kill as many of a certain kind or classification of your brothers as you can and we will reward you for it because it is a violation of your early training end quote a violation of your early training where we've we've taught to be good to our fellow men and then we just have to violate that and that's a very interesting um, point he makes about the army and cyrus uh, adam's father wants adam to go against his will but he doesn't want charles to go interestingly even though you'd think that charles would be more suited quote and this is cyrus speaking charles is not afraid so he could never learn anything about courage he does not know anything outside himself so he could never gain the things i've tried to explain to you he's talking to adam to put him in an army would be to let loose things which in charles must be chained down not let loose i would not dare to let him go 
Now, Charles seems to have some kind of mental illness. He pummels Adam because he's worried that his father loves Adam more than him, Charles. And Cyrus runs after Charles with a shotgun. But Charles, after this, escapes to a bar and he hides for two weeks and Adam is enlisted in the cavalry. Charles writes very sweetly to Adam um, when he's in the army and Adam tries hard when he's in the army to be a pacifist but it's very, very difficult. Then we have a lovely description of the Hamilton children. We learn that the narrator is Olive's child and we learn that Lisa hates booze and anything to do with drinking. There's a wonderful quote here. This is her husband speaking. Quote, Once when he was very ill, Samuel asked, Lisa, couldn't I have a glass of whiskey to ease me? She sets her little hard chin. Would you go to the throne of God with liquor on your breath? You would not, she said. Samuel rolled over on his side and went about his illness with ease. When Lisa was about 70, her elimination slowed up and her doctor told her to take a tablespoon of port wine for medicine. She forced down the first spoonful, making a crooked face, but it was not so bad. And from that moment, she never drew a completely sober breath. She always took the wine in a tablespoon. It was always medicine, but after a time, she was doing over a quarter day and she was a much more relaxed and happy woman. There are so many wonderfully funny and touching vignettes like this throughout the uh, first half. Anyway, Charles lives alone on the farm since Adam is in the army and Cyrus moves to Washington. So Charles is all alone and he sees prostitutes and he gets a scar which he is very ashamed of and it is referred to throughout the novel and I will talk more about scars at the end of the podcast. Adam is discharged from the army, but he can't face going home, so he re-enlists, and he is sent to Washington, where his father says he can get him into West Point. But he turns him down and decides to, quote, rot in barracks. Charles then employs a lady to clean the house for Adam's return, but he never does return to the farm. And the farm does quite well. Adam does another five boring years in the army and begins wandering around like a brindle stiff. And I had to look up brindle stiff. A brindle stiff is a vagrant. And there's a very interesting quote here about the time after he f- leaves the army. Quote, near Tallahassee, he was picked up by sheriff's men, judged vagrant and put on a road gang. That's how the roads were built. His sentence was six months. He was released and instantly picked up again for a second six months. And now he learned how men can consider other men as beasts and that the easiest way to get along with such men was to be a beast. A clean face, an open face, an eye raised to meet an eye. These drew attention and attention drawn brought punishment. Adam thought how a man doing an ugly or a brutal thing has hurt himself and must punish someone for the hurt. To be guarded at work by men with shotguns, to be shackled by the ankle at night to a chain, were simple matters of precaution. But the savage whippings for the least stir of will, for the smallest shred of dignity or resistance, these seemed to indicate that guards were afraid of prisoners. And Adam knew from his years in the army that a man afraid is a dangerous animal. And Adam, like anyone in the world, feared what whipping would do to his body and his spirit. He drew a curtain around himself. He removed expression from his face, light from his eyes, and silenced his speech. Later, he was not so much astonished that it had happened to him, but that he had been able to take it, and with a minimum of pain. It was much more horrible afterward than when it was happening. It is a triumph for self-control to see a man whipped until the muscles of his back show white and glistening through the cuts, and to give no sign of pity or anger or interest. And Adam learned this. People are felt rather than seen after the first few moments. During his second sentence on the roads of Florida, Adam reduced his personality to a minus. He caused no stir, put out no vibration, became as nearly invisible as it is possible to be. And when the guards could not feel him, they were not afraid of him. They gave him the jobs of cleaning the camps, of handing out the slops of the prisoners, of filling the water buckets. It goes on. Late in the night, he heard the hounds go by covering both sides of the river. He had rubbed his hair hard with green leaves to cover human odour. He sat in the water with his nose and eyes clear. In the morning, the hounds came back, disinterested, and the men were too tired to beat the banks properly. When they were gone, Adam dug a piece of water log, fried sore belly out of his pocket and ate it. 
It really reminds me of a a short story called Big Two-Hearted River by Hemingway. And what a marvellous description of post-army vagrancy. Cyrus dies. He was a wealthy man. In fact, he was a mason. I don't know whether that has any impact on his wealth, but he was a mason uh, that we didn't realise before. And he leaves both boys with $93,000. Anyway, Charles and Adam do reunite. Charles says, I loved father. And Adam says, well, I hated him. And Charles says, he loved you more than anything in the world. And Charles explains that father must be dishonest in some way. Quote, Charles's words were thin and sallow. He was not at Chancellorsville. He was not at Gettysburg or the Wilderness or Richmond or Appomattox. I think he stole the money, says Charles miserably. Adam doesn't care for for father and he takes the money on faith. But Charles loves his father and he is a realist when considering that the money might be stolen. Quote, you haven't any proof that he stole. This is Adam. You just made that up because you don't know where the money came from, Charles says. His army papers... They could be wrong, Adam said. I believe they are wrong. I believe in my father. I don't see how you can, said Charles. Adam said, let me tell you, the proofs that God does not exist are very strong, but in lots of people, they are not as strong as the feeling that he does. Charles says, but you said that you did not love our father. How can you have faith in him if you didn't love him? Maybe that's the reason, Adam said slowly, feeling his way. Maybe if I had loved him, I would have been jealous of him. You were... Maybe, maybe love makes you suspicious and doubting. So far in this book, uh, it's like that carefully constructed box that's described in the introduction. We've got these beautifully described characters, two diametrically different families, the Hamiltons and the Trasks. Uh, The family members are different. We've got two in the Trask family, nine children in the Hamilton family. We've got single-sex siblings in one. We've got a mixture in the other. One's on the east of America, one's on the west. We've also got these very, very well-constructed chapter headings we've got 11.1 11.2 like a very very carefully constructed box right at the beginning of the novel john steinbeck says well here's your box nearly everything i have is in it and it's not full pain and excitement are in it and feeling good or bad and evil thoughts and good thoughts the pleasure of design and some despair and the indescribable joy of creation and certainly we can see the pleasure of design in the construction of this novel carrying on Chapter 8 begins with the very powerful sentence, I believe there are monsters born in the world to human parents. And so Kathy Ames is introduced. She's a liar and she's self-aware. Quote, and this is Kathy's father, In her father's mind, another question stirred and he shoved it down deep and felt dishonest for thinking about it at all. Kathy had remarkable luck in finding things. A gold charm, money, a silken purse, a silver cross with red stones said to be rubies. She found many things and when her father advertised in the weekly courier about the cross, no one ever claimed it. We jump to when she's 14. James Grew, who's Kathy's Latin teacher, tries to talk at midnight with Kathy's father. He doesn't succeed and he kills himself. Again, Kathy is portrayed as a monster. Quote, that was Kathy's method. Before the next day was out, everybody in town knew that James Grew had been in trouble in Boston and no one could possibly imagine that Kathy had planted the story. Even Mrs. Ames had forgotten where she heard it. I've written in the margins that it feels like a bit of a horrible trope, this idea of a young, innocent person who is actually a deviant monster. And I've got to say, I don't particularly like it at this point in the novel. It's giving me a bit of an unhappy feeling. Anyway, continuing on, Kathy is now 16. She wakes up and she doesn't want to go to school. Again, we have this kind of trope of a typical teenager quote in the afternoon kathy rose listlessly from her bed and spent a long time in front of the mirror she takes the train to boston and then her dad whips her which is quite an incredible thing for for any parent to do and this whipping however seems to turn her into a saint but kathy burnt down the ames home killing the parents there's this awful fire and kathy's ribbon is found but not her body and the last line there's a clue quote kathy left a scent of sweetness behind her Now, Mr. Edwards, a family man who has a wife and two kids, runs a series of brothels from Boston. And guess who walks in? Yes, 
Catherine Amesbury. So she's changed her name. And there's a lot of name changing in the novel, which I'll talk about later. He rents a sweet little brick house for her. And Mr. Edwards falls in love with Cathy but eventually suspects her of the fire. And using this power, he forces her to one of his brothels, packing a suitcase for her with her box of money in. She resists and he bashes her head in, leaving her for dead with a horrible scar on her head, although she's not dead. And I'm just thinking, what awful retribution is she going to be taking on Mr. Edwards? Meanwhile, back with the Trask brothers, Charles is still feeling guilty about what he thinks is dishonest money. And the brothers are bickering constantly. Adam wants to go to California, but he doesn't seem to have the heart to leave his brother. And Charles has a very strong work ethic. Adam can't see the point since he's so rich. Father has left them both so much money. Quote, Adam went on... Every morning in the army, that damn bugle would sound, and I swore to God if I ever got out, I would sleep till noon every day. In here, I get up at half past four in the morning. Will you tell me, Charles, what in hell are we working for? Charles says, you can't lay in bed and run a farm. Adam explains he escaped prison three days early, and... His brother says, you're a jailbird. And although Charles is rich, he doesn't live rich. They have an outside toilet. And at this point, the story of the brothers Adam and Charles and Cathy collide. Adam's discussing visiting Paris, and Charles says, what's that? (laughs) When Cathy appears, she's very wounded. Adam tends to her wounds sweetly while Charles gets a doctor. So in the margins I've written, the monster has entered their house. What mayhem is about to ensue, and mayhem does ensue. Adam is insistent that Cathy stays. I've put again in the margin, finally Adam has some calling, some purpose to help Cathy get better. I can't help seeing an approaching train wreck. Poor Adam. A biblical name, Adam before had a lover who turned out bad. Again, a typical male trope perhaps. Anyway, Cathy comes round. She's scared of Mr. Edwards that he knows about the fire and she's scared to be questioned by the sheriff. So she pretends that she doesn't know who she is. Uh, Quote, and this is the sheriff speaking, poor child. I thank you for trying anyway, because you can't remember her name. When you get better, we'll try again. No, you don't have to write any more. The pencil wrote, thank you, and fell from her fingers. She had won the sheriff. He ranged himself with Adam. Only Charles was against her. When the brothers were in her room, and it took two of them to help her on the bedpan without hurting her, she studied Charles's dark sullenness. He had something in his face that she recognised that made her uneasy. She saw that he touched the scar on his forehead very often, rubbed it and drew its outline with his fingers. Once he caught her watching, he looked guiltily at his fingers. Charles said brutally, "'Don't you worry, you're going to have one like it, maybe even a better one.' She smiled at him and he looked away. When Adam came in with her warm soup, Charles said, I'm going in town and drinking some beer. I paused on Scar because, again, the Scar becomes such an important symbol throughout the novel. The Scar that Charles has was an accident rather than a fight with Adam. And maybe self-inflicted Scars is going to be an important theme in the novel. Anyway, Adam continues to care for Cathy, but Charles just doesn't trust Cathy. Charles says, quote, I don't believe you lost your memory. And Cathy says, but why should I lie? Charles says, I don't know. That's why I don't trust you. There's something I almost recognise. Cathy says, you never saw me in your life. And Charles says, maybe not, but there's something that bothers me that I ought to know. And how do you know I never saw you? How can he have seen her before? I, I just don't know. Uh, this parallels the untrustworthiness he has for his father. Personally, I can't see why he's so hateful towards her. Sure, she's coming between him and his brother. But it makes me think that the narrator is being untruthful to the character of Charles. Charles pretends to Cathy that he heard her say things in her delirious state, and this scares her. Cathy says to Adam, your brother doesn't like me. He wants me to get out of here. But Adam says, he can't. I own half the farm. So that's her plan. She's going to drive a wedge between the brothers. And I've written in the margin that the character of Cathy is simplistic and flat because the narrator has said, quote, I believe monsters can be born to human parents. 
It doesn't have to work through any issues she may have. This makes me feel a bit angry towards the narrator, but I think this this may change. I think it, I think my feelings towards Cathy will change later. We have a lovely description of Adam's anger towards his brother, combined with a keen observation of the natural world. Quote, Adam stood up and strode out of the room. He went to the back door and looked out on the afternoon. Far off in the field, his brother was lifting stones from a sledge and piling them on the stone wall. Adam looked up at the sky. A blanket of herring clouds was rolling in from the east. He sighed deeply and his breath made a tickling, exciting feeling in his chest. His ears seemed suddenly clear so that he heard Heard the chickens cackling and the east wind blowing over the ground. He heard horses' hoofs plodding on the road and far off pounding on wood where a neighbour was shingling a barn. And all these sounds related into a kind of music. His eyes were clear too. Fences and walls and sheds stood staunchly out in the yellow afternoon and they were related too. There was a change in everything. A flight of sparrows dropped into the dust and scrabbled for bits of food and then flew off like a grey scarf twisting in the light. Adam looked back at his brother. He had lost track of time and he did not know how long he had been standing in the doorway. There was a change in everything. This seems ominously pivotal. Cathy, what have you done? We'll find out that change is a really important theme throughout the novel and there's more examples where change is, is articulated very specifically. Anyway, Adam proposes and Cathy wants this for protection and money, but she waits and she does admire Charles. In the margins I've written, she may be a clinical psychopath. Adam had a warmth toward her which she did not understand since she had none toward him, nor had ever experienced it toward anyone. And that's a quote from the book. Alex... Platt uh, discovers a suitcase of Mr Edwards' clothes and Cathy's box of money left at the scene of Cathy's attack. And Charles seems to have had some kind of supernatural dislike of Cathy. Quote, I know it, I don't trust her, there's something, something, I don't know what it is, but I don't like it. When are you going to get her out? And Adam can't comprehend this. He marries Cathy and Charles is not understanding. Cathy plies Adam with opium and seduces Charles and he is willing. But I guess it's because she's the devil and has these magical, alluring powers. So part two comes along of the novel. Narrator says, it's a new century, we can start afresh. It's a very chatty, very Dickensian kind of philosophical opening. Um, I guess the narrator is a male. Um, Quote, he talks about, quote, the thighs of women have lost their clutch. Um, Sounds like the sort of thing a male narrator might say. The narrator is negative about mass production. Quote, When our food and clothing and housing are all born in the complication of mass production, mass method is bound to get into our thinking and to eliminate all other thinking. He's also negative about teamwork. Quote, Our species is the only creative species and it has only one creative instrument, the individual mind and spirit of man. Nothing was ever created by two men. There are no good collaborations, whether in music, in art, in poetry, in mathematics, in philosophy. Once the miracle of creation has taken place, the group can build and extend it, but the group never invents anything. The preciousness lies in the lonely mind of a man." He goes on, the free exploring mind of the individual human is the most valuable thing in the world. And this I would fight for, the freedom of the mind to take any direction it wishes, undirected. And he carries on, if the glory can be killed, we are lost. And this idea of glory being free will is an important theme that will come across later. And it got me thinking about society. You know, that's, that's a really positive thing about teamwork. And maybe putting a man on the moon, that's a really positive thing about teamwork as well. So I think maybe overly negative there. Adam sells his half of the farm and Adam and Kathy head west to the Salinas Valley. Kathy is pregnant and she tries to abort the baby. Adam falls in love with a Bordoni ranch and tries to track down Sam Hamilton to bore a well for him. Adam meets with the rambling Sam Hamilton, quote, there's a blackness on the valley, he talks like a seer, and it's ironic that he's an expert in drilling wells for others, but his land is actually a drought. We then hear about the character of Olive Hamilton, as told by her son, the book's narrator. She's an upright member of society, a teacher, and she's parsimonious. There's a lovely quote about her. 
quote, she planted that terror of debt so deeply in her children that even now in a changed economic pattern where indebtedness is a part of living, I become restless when a bill is two days overdue. Olive never accepted the time payment plan when it became popular. A thing bought on time was a thing you did not own and for which you were in debt she saved for things she wanted and this meant that the neighbors had new gadgets as much as two years before we did in world war one quote when they killed martin hops who was a local boy olive declared war on the german empire and she wins a competition and hilariously is then taken on a military flight that scares her witless going back to adam he builds a house suitable for his quote dynasty everyone in the valley looks to the future and there's a feeling of optimism quote there were others who prophesied with rays shining on their foreheads about the sometime ditches that would carry water all over the valley who knows maybe in our lifetime or deep wells with steam engines to pump the water up out of the guts of the world can you imagine just think what this land would raise with plenty of water why it will be a garden and he looks lovingly at kathy but, quote, Cathy had the one quality required of a great and successful criminal. She trusted no one, confided in no one. Herself was an island. It is probable that she did not even look at Adam's new land or building house or turn his towering plans to reality in her mind because she did not intend to live here after her sickness was over, after her trap opened. What is her trap? Adam sends Lee to fetch Sam Hamilton to talk about drilling a hole. And Lee is Adam's Chinese servant. He reveals that actually he can speak English perfectly. Again, we have this question about identity. Quote, and this is Lee talking. I understand you were not born in America. No, says Sam, in Ireland. And in a few years, says Lee, you can almost disappear, while I, who was born in Grass Valley, went to school and several years to the University of California, have no chance of mixing. Sam says, if you cut your cue, dressed and talked like other people. And Lee says, no, I tried it. To the so-called whites, I was still a Chinese, but an untrustworthy one. And at the same time, my Chinese friends steered clear of me. I had to give it up. He carries on. Lee smiles satirically at him. In a few minutes, I don't think you'll find a loose bar I've missed in a lifetime of search. I did go back to China. My father was a fairly successful man. It didn't work. They said I looked like a foreign devil. They said I spoke like a foreign devil. I made mistakes in manners and I didn't know delicacies that had grown up since my father left. They wouldn't have me. You can believe it or not, I'm less foreign here than I was in China. He continues... The trouble with pigeon is that you get to thinking in pigeon. I write a great deal to keep my English up. Hearing and reading aren't the same as speaking and writing. Don't you ever make a mistake? I mean, break into English, said Sam. Lee says, no, I don't. I think it's a matter of what is expected. You look at a man's eyes. You see that he expects pigeon and a shuffle. So you speak pigeon and shuffle. I guess that's right, said Samuel. In my own way, I tell jokes because people come all the way to my place to laugh. I try to be funny for them, even when the sadness is on me. Lee says, but the Irish are said to be a happy people, full of jokes. Sam says, there's your pigeon and your cue. They're not. They're a dark people with a gift for suffering, way past their deserving. It's said that without whiskey to soak and soften the world, they'd kill themselves. But they all tell jokes because it's expected of them. Samuel augurs for water. Adam says, tell me about your stick. How does it work? Samuel stroked the fork, now tied to his saddle strings. I don't really believe in it, save that it works. He smiled at Adam. Maybe it's this way. Maybe I know where the water is. I feel it in my skin. Some people have a gift in this direction or that. Suppose, well, call it humility or a deep disbelief in myself. Forced me to do a magic to bring up to the surface the thing I know anyway. Does that make any sense to you? So humility forced me to do magic, to bring to the surface something I knew already. I think that's just a great quote. Sam refers to Adam's wife as eve here's a quote look samuel i mean to make a garden of my land remember my name is adam so far i've had no eden let alone being driven out he carries on adam said i won't plant apples that would be looking for accidents what does eve say to that says samuel she has a say you remember and eve's delight in apples not this one adam says his eyes shining you don't know this eve she'll celebrate my choice i don't think anyone can know her goodness 
And Sam says, you have a rarity. Right now, I can't recall any greater gift. And this hammers home the fallen woman theme. It also shows that comparison with Lee, brilliantly hiding her true identity, just as well as Lee is hiding his true identity. Samuel gives Adam some strange sort of satirical advice, like a seer. He seems to warn Adam about Kathy and Samuel dines with Kathy and Adam and Kathy acts very strangely but Adam seems to be blind to that and I've written in the margin she's so vacant her mind is elsewhere and Lee attempts to find work at Samuel's I think he's desperate to get out of there so Sam Hamilton seems to be in touch with some kind of mythical magical Irish past full of uh, leprechauns and folk magic and pixies at least that's the way I see him his character at the moment Anyway, Kathy says she won't stay and Adam brushes her off and Sam returns to his home and there's this uh, lovely evocation of a moonlit night which foreshadows the rest of the chapter. Quote, Samuel Hamilton rode back home in a night so flooded with moonlight that the hills took on the quality of the white and dusty moon. The trees and earth were moon dry, silent and airless and dead. The shadows were black without shading and the open places white without colour. Here and there Samuel could see secret movement, for the moon feeders were at work, the deer which browse all night when the moon is clear and sleep under thickets in the day. Rabbits and field mice and all other small hunted feel safe in the concealing light, crept and hopped and crawled and froze to resemble stones or small bushes when ear or no suspected danger. The predators were working too, the long weasels like waves of brown light, the cobby wild cats crouching near to the ground, almost invisible except when their yellow eyes caught light and flashed for a second, the foxes sniffling with pointed up raised noses for a warm-blooded supper, the raccoons padding near still water, talking frogs, the coyotes nuzzled along the slopes and torn with sorrow joy raised their heads and shouted their feeling, half keen, half laughter at their goddess moon. And over all the shadowy screech, owls sailed, drawing a smudge of shadowy fear below them on the ground. The wind of the afternoon was gone, and only a little breeze, like a sigh, was stirred by the restless thermals of the warm, dry hills. These night thoughts are made real because Sam recalls where he has seen Kathy's eyes before and recounts the hanging of the, quote, golden man in Londonderry when he was a child. He had similar eyes. He resolves to help, quote, the Salinas Valley Eden to make a secret guilt payment for his ugly thoughts. And back at Sam's ranch, there's just Lisa and Tom and Joe, his two sons. And Sam tells Lisa he will work at the Trask Ranch. But Lisa is sceptical and she does warn him. She says, stay away. Quote, what was she doing? She's talking about Kathy. Who? Why, Mrs. Trask, of course. Doing? Why, sitting, sitting in a chair under an oak tree. Her time's not far, because she's pregnant. Her hands, Samuel, her hands. What was she doing with her hands, said Lisa. Samuel searches memory. Nothing, I guess. I remember she had little hands and she held them clasped in her lap. Lisa sniffed. Not sewing, not mending, not knitting. No, mother. He calls her mother. I don't know that it's a good idea for you to go over there. Riches and idleness, devil's tools. Lisa refers to the smell of the pigs at Adam's ranch. Quote, well, Mr. Trask is making great changes. He's fitting up the old house to live in. That's Samuel speaking. Lisa turns sharply from the stove. The one where the cows and pigs have slept for the years, Samuel says, oh, he's ripped out the floors and window casings, all new and new painted. Lisa says, he'll never get rid of the smell of the pigs. She said firmly. There's a pungency left by a pig that nothing can wash out or cover up. Well, I went inside and looked around, Mother, and I could smell nothing except paint, Lisa says. When the paint dries, you'll smell pig. So is that smell supposed to symbolise Cathy's dark past? That it can't be erased, possibly. Anyway, the Hamiltons begin work, uh, Tom and Joe and Father Samuel, and they find a nickel and silver shooting star just before Lee comes to tell them about Cathy giving birth. So Sam ushers Adam away, because he's too stressed out at that time, and after a vicious bite to his hand, two sons are born to Cathy. She rejects both of them, though. Samuel is spooked and sends Lee to fetch his wife. Quote, 
I want my wife, Samuel cried. No dreams, no ghosts, no foolishness. I want her here. They say miners take canaries into pits to test the air. Lisa has no truck with foolishness. And Lee, if Lisa sees a ghost, it's a ghost and not a fragment of a dream. If Lisa feels trouble, we'll bar the doors. So poor Sam gets his hand looked at by a doctor and Tom feeds him some chicken soup. And this is a very funny bit. Quote, and Tom brought him chicken soup until he wanted to kill him. The law had not died out of the world and you will still find people who believe that soup will cure any hurt or illness and is no bad thing to have for the funeral either. A bit of light-hearted relief in a very dark chapter. Lisa stays with Kathy for a week and at the return there's the interrogation and she says of Kathy. Quote, it's a strange thing, this is Lisa speaking, I can find no real fault with her, save perhaps a touch of laziness, and yet I don't like her very much. Maybe it's that scar. Lee is looking after the twins, uh, and when Lee gets some time off, Kathy decides to leave. Adam locks her in her room, but when she says sorry, he enters and she shoots him in the shoulder before walking off. And I've written some notes in the margin. Just, it could have been worse knowing her past, but I'm quite sure it will leave a nasty scar. Anyway, Adam says that he accidentally shot himself when the deputy sheriff, Horace, comes over. He doesn't believe Adam at all. And Adam reveals Kathy had a secret and a scar. And this deputy swears in his friend Julius to keep watch while he heads to a train back to King City and chats with the Monterey County Sheriff. He has heard that a local brothel has taken in someone who matches Kathy's description. Samuel comes over to work on the wells, but Adam says, please don't. And then Sam gives him some really, really good advice. Obviously, Sam is incredibly upset about the fact that his wife has just shot him and walked out. Samuel says, quote, go through the motions, Adam. What motions? says Adam. Act out being alive like a play, and after a while, a long while, it will be true. Why should I? Adam asked. Samuel was looking at the twins. You're going to pass something down no matter what you do, or if you do nothing. Even if you let yourself go fallow, the weeds will grow and the brambles. Something will grow. And then we are introduced to the two important brothels of Salinas. Faze and the Long Green. And Kathy now, Kate, works at Faze and she is the perfect employee. She's checked out by the sheriff and he doesn't want any trouble on his patch so he tells her to keep a low profile even though he knows that she shot Adam and ran away. Quote, I don't want to make a record, he said quietly. I've held office a long time. About one more term will be enough. He carries on. Don't you want to know how bad you shot him? Yes, she said. Well, he's going to get well. Smashed his shoulder, but he's going to get well. That chink is taking pretty good care of him. Of course, I don't think he'll lift anything with his left arm for quite a spell. A forty-four tears hell out of a man. If that chink hadn't come back, he'd have bled to death, and you'd be staying with me in the jail. Fay asks her to go blonde, but Kathy says she's protecting someone. So she doesn't. Fay thinks of Kathy like a daughter and doesn't want her to work. And Kathy says to Fay, quote, I have to, mother. And the word mother really did it for her. Kathy there being manipulative as ever. Quote, mother and quote, daughter exchange gifts, but they both get drunk and Kathy reveals her evil side. And when Fay falls asleep, Kathy drugs her and physically abuses her. And then Kathy gets sick and gets lots of pills from Dr. Wilde. And then Kathy kills Faye, having received this gift of the will from Faye. She's basically left everything to her, her brothel, her, her business. Meanwhile, Adam Trask has sunken into a stupor over Kathy leaving. He hasn't even named the boys, quote, they were a symbol of his loss. Against Lisa's wishes, quote, you don't change Adam, he changes you. He agrees with Lee to visit Adam. Lisa gives her mother's Bible to Samuel to take to Adam's. And at this point, I've written in the, the margin about the blurb. Um, it, it mentions Cain and Abel. I'm really thinking, OK, I need to read up on Cain and Abel. So I do. And actually, the whole next chapter is all about Cain and Abel. It reveals as well, East of Eden is where Cain uh, was banished, a land called Nod. And so obviously that's where the title of the novel comes from. Samuel beats Adam into realisation, like slapping an unconscious person to bring them round. And Adam worries his children may have bad blood. Quote, 
I would like to know what kind of blood is in my boys when they grow up. Won't I be looking for something in them? Yes, yes, you will, said Sam. And I will warn you now that not their blood, but your suspicion might build evil in them. They will be what you expect of them. But their blood, said Adam. I don't very much believe in blood, said Samuel. I think when a man finds good or bad in his children, he is seeing only what he planted in them. They talk about naming children. Quote, names are a great mystery. This is Sam speaking. I've never known whether the name is moulded by the child or the child changed to fit the name, but you can be sure of this. Whenever a human has a nickname, it is proof that the names given to him were wrong. And then Adam looks at his kids for the first time. Quote, that one looks like my brother. And at that point, I'm thinking, of course, these could be Charles's children, not Adam's, because she becomes pregnant just after the scene as they are moving to Selena's. Perhaps that was a further motivation for wanting an abortion. They philosophise on, quote, living up to a name and the idea of greatness. Samuel recounts the tale of Cain and Abel. If Charles has the scar, I'm thinking, maybe he is the Cain figure. And finally, after lots of theological discussion, the twins are named Aaron and Caleb. Then we go on to part three, and the narrator describes all her aunts, uh, that's Samuel's children, and there's some wonderful descriptions. For example, Una, who very sadly died, is described, quote, She didn't laugh and play like the rest of us. There was something set apart about her. She seemed always to be listening. When she was reading, her face would be like the face of one listening to music. And when we asked her any question, why, she gave the answer if she knew it, not pointed up and full of colour and maybes and it might be the way the rest of us would. So she dies and it's possibly suicide. And Tom... Uh, is described with his darkness, quote, he could be as gay as his father and suddenly in the middle it would be cut the way you would cut a violin string and you could watch Tom go whirling into darkness. And he had a wonderful attitude to gambling. Quote, I've tried it and it just seems tiresome. This is Tom speaking. I've thought why this might be. I get no great triumph when I win and no tragedy when I lose. Without these, it's meaningless. I think that's a really, really good summing up of gambling. And we learn that Mary wants to be a boy. And Uncle Tom is a big influence. The narrator recalls Tom taking him fishing. Such a wonderful description of the fishing trip. Quote, I remember the five-fingered ferns growing under little waterfalls, bobbing their green fingers as the droplets struck them. And I remember the smells of the hills, wild azalea and a very distant skunk, and the sweet cloy of lupin and horse sweat on harness. I remember the sweeping lovely dance of high buzzards against the sky and Tom looking long up at them, but I can't remember that he ever said anything about them. I remember holding the bite of a line while Tom drove pegs and braided a splice. I remember the smell of crushed ferns in the creel and the delicate sweet odour of fresh damp rainbow trout lying so prettily on the green bed. And finally, I can remember coming back to the rig and pouring rolled barley into the leather feed bag and buckling it over the horse's head behind the ears. And I have no sound of his voice or words in my ear. He is dark and silent and hugely warm in my memory. Tom is also a poet. And then Desi is described, and she runs an underwear shop for women. There's a wonderful description of her laughter. Quote, I can see Desi now, her gold pince-nez wobbling on her nose, not properly bridged for pince-nez, her eyes streaming with hilarious tears and her whole front constricted with muscular spasms of laughter. But her laughter stopped when she fell in love and this seems to drive Tom into despair. Thanksgiving 1911 and all the Hamiltons get together and the children comment that Samuel is old and this is possibly quickened by Una's death. They arrange for Sam and Lisa to take turns visiting the children and Tom will look after the ranch. And I can't help feeling that Moody Tom, to look after the ranch on his own, that sounds like a recipe for disaster, but let's see what happens. Tom hands Samuel a letter stating that they can stay on, quote, vacation with the narrator's mother, Olive. Samuel can see through Tom. He knows he won't be coming back to the ranch. The narrator philosophises as to why Una's death affected Samuel so greatly. Quote, Samuel may have thought and played and philosophised about death, but he did not really believe in it. His world did not have death as a member. He and all around him was immortal. When real death came, it was an outrage, a denial of the immortality he deeply felt, and the one crack in his wall caused the whole structure to crash. I think he had always thought he could argue himself out of death. It was a personal opponent and one he could lick. And Lisa, however, accepts death. 
Her thoughts on heaven are hilarious. Quote, and she looked forward to heaven as a place where clothes did not get dirty and where food did not have to be cooked and dishes washed. Privately, there were some things in heaven of which she did not quite approve. There was too much singing and she didn't see how even the elect could survive very long the celestial laziness which was promised. She would find something to do in heaven. There must be something to take up one's time. Some clowns to darn some weary wings to rub with liniment. Maybe the collars of the robes needed turning now and then, and when you come right down to it, she couldn't believe that even heaven there would be not cobwebs in some corner to be knocked down with a cloth-covered broom. Samuel visits Adam before he leaves for Salinas and tells him, quote, you must let Cathy go. And they both share a powerful loss. So Adam has lost Cathy and Samuel has lost Una. And Samuel says to Adam, Find a new Cathy. And Adam says to Samuel, OK, help me plant an Eden here. But Sam says, no, I'm caught in a web of my children and I think I like that. Lee philosophizes over determinism and free will and he consults with scholars and translates the original passage of the Bible into Hebrew, the phrase, thou mayest, triumph over sin, which puts man at the centre of the decision-making process. Doxology Sam's Horse has been a star of the book so far, and there's a lovely description of uh, Doxology. Quote, I picked him when he was a cult. Do you know, this is Sam speaking, do you know I paid $2 for him 33 years ago? Everything was wrong with him. Hooves like flapjacks, a hock so thick and short and straight there seems no joint at all. He's hammer-headed and sway-backed. He has a pinched chest and a big behind. He has no iron mouth and he still fights the crupper. With a saddle he feels as though you were riding a sledge over a gravel pit. He can't trot and he stumbles over his feet when he walks. I have never, in 30 three years found one good thing about him he even has an ugly disposition he is selfish and quarrelsome and mean and disobedient to this day i don't dare walk behind him because he will surely take a kick at me when i feed him mash he tries to bite my hand and i love him brilliant adam says that the death for the horse may be more comfortable and this leads on beautifully to sam's comments quote if i had a medicine that might cure you but also kill you would you take it and adam agrees to take the medicine so samuel tells him that kathy is running a debased whorehouse in salinas uh, Leah is shocked that he has taken such a strong stand to mention this to adam quote you're a kind man, Mr. Hamilton, and I've always thought it was the kindness that comes from not wanting any trouble, and your mind is as facile as a young lamb leaping in a daisy field. You have never, to my knowledge, taken a bulldog grip on anything, and then tonight you did a thing that tears down my whole picture of you. Samuel wrapped the lines around a stick stuck in the whip socket, and doxology stumbled on down the rutty road. The old man stroked his beard, and it shone very white in the starlight. He took off his black hat and laid it in his lap. I guess it's surprised me as much as it did you, he said, but if you want to know why, look into yourself. I don't understand you. If you had only told me about your studies earlier, it might have made a great difference, Lee. I still don't understand you, said Lee. Careful, Lee, you'll get me talking. I told you my Irish came and went. It's coming now, Lee said. Mr Hamilton, you're going away and you're not coming back. You do not intend to live very much longer. That's true, Lee. How did you know? There's death all around you. It shines from you. I didn't know anyone could see it, Samuel said. You know, Lee, I think of my life as a kind of music, not always good music, but still having form and melody, and my life has not been a full orchestra for a long time now. A single note only, and that note unchanging sorrow. I'm not alone in my attitude, Lee. It seems to me that too many of us conceive of a life as ending in defeat, Lee said. Maybe everyone is too rich. I have noticed that there is no dissatisfaction like that of the rich. Feed a man, clothe him, put him in good house, and he will die of despair. It was your two-word retranslation, Lee, thou mayest. It took me by the throat and shook me, and when the dizziness was over, a path was open, new and bright, and my life, which is ending, seems to be going on to an ending wonderful. And my music has a new last melody, like a bird song in the night. He was peering at him through the darkness. That's what it did to those old men of my family, said Lee. Thou mayest rule over sin, Lee. That's it. I do not believe all men are destroyed. I can name you a dozen who are not, and they are the ones the world lives by. 
It is true of the spirit as it is true of battles. Only the winners are remembered. Surely most men are destroyed, but there are others who, like pillars of fire, guide frightened men through the darkness. Thou mayest, thou mayest. What glory! It is true that we are weak and sick and quarrelsome, but if that is all we ever were, we would millenniums ago have disappeared from the face of the earth. A few remnants of fossilised jawbone, some broken teeth in strata of limestone, would be the only mark man would have left of his existence in the world. But the choice, Lee, the choice of winning, I had never understood it or accepted it before. Do you see now why I told Adam tonight? I exercised the choice. Maybe I was wrong, but by telling him, I also forced him to live or get off the pot. Wow. What a powerful ending to the first part of the book. So questions to be hopefully answered in the second half. What will happen to Cathy? Will she be murdered by Adam? Will she change? I don't think it's likely. I think the narrator is clear she was, quote, born a monster and will likely stay a monster. Will her crime of killing her parents be discovered? I'm thinking probably. And will her crime of killing Faye be discovered? I just don't know about that one. Then the next question, will Charles' dalliance with Cathy be discovered? Maybe by Cathy as retribution against Adam. And are the children, Aaron and Caleb, Charles's children? I think that's a bit of a non-issue. I think there are big issues at stake. And then what will happen to Charles? I just don't know at this stage. We left him a long time ago now. He just had an affair with Cathy. It was 11 years ago. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen with him. Will Adam and Charles' father get found out? I'm quite sure he will, but I'm not sure what the ramifications will be. And like the story of Cain and Abel, will the brothers come to blows? Quite possible they might do. I want to just talk through a few interesting points that really pervaded the whole novel, I guess. The idea of these scars. There's so many scars. Cathy has a scar. Charles has a scar. Some of them are self-inflicted, some of them aren't. The scars get darker and lighter. When the pregnancy is mentioned, Cathy's scar got darker. And then Horace, the deputy sheriff, notices that she has a scar. And the sheriff notices the scar at Kate's brothel. So scars are very important. And change... Um, as a boundary or a threshold is very important in the novel, I think. Quote, something was changed. Uh, that was when Mr Edwards suspects Cathy of the fine. And at the beginning of part two, quote, there was a change in everything. That was 1900, a great boundary. And then there was a change when Cathy drives a wedge between Adam and Charles. Quote, there was a change in everything. And when discussing the change of century, 1800s to the 1900s, quote, you can see how this book has reached a great boundary that was called 1900, for the world was changing. So change is a very important idea in the novel. Glory is defined on page 161. Quote, if the glory can be killed, we are lost. It's the free exploring mind of the individual human. Quote, the freedom of the mind to take any direction it wishes undirected. And through Adam's experience of Cathy, he achieves glory. Quote, it would be absurd if we did not understand both angels and devils since we invented them. His experience of routine in the army has hindered him somewhat, Adam. He is unquestioning and unthinking, especially when it comes to Cyrus Trask, his father's evident guilt. But that does change. He subverts a very loaded religious word by using the word glory, the, the narrator. Uh, the dictionary definition is praise, worship and thanksgiving offered to a deity. And if glory represents free will, then Lee's discovery of thou mayest defines glory. Next big idea, religion. The narrator believes in a man-made religion. Quote, it would be absurd if we did not understand both angels and devils. And then we've got this idea of glory again, man-made glory, subverting the usual religious connotation. And then obviously we've got the Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve references and Lee's interest in scripture and his thou mayest. The next thing that's very interesting in the book is the idea of identity. Lee pretending he's Chinese and that must take so much energy and there's a parallel with Kathy. Kathy has a similar job pretending that she's not a monster. And Samuel being Irish has similar feelings about identity. Quote, it's hard to split a man down the middle and always to reach for the same half. It's a wonderful quote from Adam. And then we've got all these name changes. It starts off Cathy Ames and then she's Catherine Amesbury for Mr Edwards and then she's Kate for Faye. And we've got the name changes Aaron to Aaron and Caleb to Cal. And Samuel did mention that, that if you have to change your name, it's not a great sign. 
And then we also got the hair changes, Kathy being blonde but then dyeing her hair. And the lack of identity enrages Samuel so much that he, he goes to see Adam, to a- attack Adam into realising that he needs to name his babies. So the title East of Eden comes from Cain being thrown out of Eden. The East of Eden was the land of Nod. This There's another really nice thing going on in the novel, which is this idea of small details, which James Wood would call thisness. For example... Kathy's controlling nature, there's a lovely detail that shows the aspect of her character, quote, setting the book straight in the doctor's office. And then there's little details like the whistling in the nose, page 251. It's just a, such a small detail, but it really brings the book to life. Quote, there was a whistle in Horace's nose. He had to breathe through his mouth to stop it. He moved slowly up from the foot of the bed nearer to Adam's head. Just little details like that. There's another one. Um, Sam and Adam are discussing theology and they are interrupted by one of the twins, quote, one of the twins awakened and yawned and looked at Lee and went to sleep again. And then the conversation continues. It's, some people have called it the listness, the idea of like little details that really put you in the moment. And drink, drink is an important theme. Drink is to Kathy as kryptonite is to Superman. It makes her lose herself completely. For example, when she has just been offered uh, the will by Faye and she has a drink. And then we have some really interesting ideas about greatness. Uh, mediocrity quote adam said i wondered why a man of your knowledge would work a desert hill place and sam says it's because i haven't courage i could never quite take the responsibility when the lord god did not call my name i might have called his name but i did not there you have the difference between greatness and mediocrity i think there are degrees of greatness adam said i don't think so said samuel that would be like saying there is little bigness no i believe when you come to that responsibility the hugeness and you are alone to make your choice on one side you have warmth and companionship and sweet understanding on the other cold lonely greatness i'd now like to share some of your thoughts on last month's book the moon and the bonfire by cesar pavese there were some wonderful comments on the web and on goodreads and most of the comments seem to be universally in praise of Bavese's beautiful style and evocation of this very hot, nostalgic novel. Bill said, quote, that the writing is uniformly brilliant and his description of landscapes is absolutely sublime. And Justin wrote, quote, he manages to combine very intelligent symbolism, the moon, basically, the other side of the fence, where the grass is greener, etc., but where there is also nothing there. And then there's the bonfires and the superstitions, but also the rootedness of the old world. And Hind wrote, quote, It seems like nostalgia here isn't just going back to the memory, but rather wanting to feel its flesh swell and pulsate with life. It's a yearn to all those things one could compile and put in a place that perhaps then, bitterly or sweetly, could be called home. Jay Husher wrote, Quote, a tremendous work, dark and with a subtle vein of concision that never appears simple. Pavese is the master of the long simmering gotcha. So there you have it. Thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Email bookshook at yahoo.com or leave a comment at the Bookshook YouTube channel. I'd also love suggestions for future books to read together. Maybe there's been one sitting on your shelf for ages which you haven't got around to reading and you just need that push to get started. Talking of next books, after I publish part two of East of Eden, the next podcast will be the first half of Norwegian Wood by Murakami. So get that one at the ready if you can. Anyway, I look forward to discussing the final part of East of Eden at the next episode in a couple of weeks. See you then. Mm-hmm.